Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar. My name is Stacey Sinclair, and we are delighted to be back here again with you today. Uh, thank you very much for joining. And in fact, I think we have a record-breaking uh, numbers in terms of registration today from everyone around the world. Welcome. And I think this is a real testament to the importance and significance of today's topic, which of course is termination, the latest, as you can see there on the screen, the latest legal and contractual issues. And we're going to include, of course, the recent case of Energy Works Hull Limited versus MW High Tech Projects Limited and others. And who better to take us through this today than two of the senior lawyers on that case, Fennec Elliott partner Karen Gidwani and for Pump Court barrister Sanjay Patel. And we are also joined, thankfully, today by Fennec Elliott senior partner Simon Tolson. Now, before I leave you in their very capable hands, um, just a few of the usual admin points. Um, of course, everyone is on mute. Uh, and we encourage you to ask questions as we go by popping them in the questions box, which no doubt you will have found on the right hand side of your screen in the toolbar. Um, and of course, um, you will see in due course that we have some very content rich slides for you today. And rest assured, a copy of these slides will be on our website along with a recording of this session um, in due course after the webinar. So with that, I shall leave you with Karen, Sanjay, and Simon. Thank you. Thank you, Stacey. Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome. Um, before turning to our discussion, I thought I'd just like to make some brief introductions. My name is Karen Gidwani, and I'm a partner at Fennec Elliott, specialising in dispute resolution. Um, my practice covers all types of construction and engineering projects, and I've advised on termination and termination strategy many times. Um, Simon Tolson is our senior partner and brings with him a wealth of experience to his work. Simon's well versed with the intricacies of termination and will be leading the discussion on things like notices and the recent case law. Simon is also the honorary president of TEXA and has recently won the Claire Edwards Award for his services to the um, construction law industry and is currently sitting as a commissioner on the Building the Future Commission for 2023, which has been uh, which is a project which has been started by Building Magazine to um, report on problems and challenges and possible solutions in key areas of the industry. We also have with us today Sanjay, Sanjay Patel, who is a barrister at Four Punt Court. Sanjay has also an enormous breadth of experience, both domestically and internationally, has done a lot of work in the Middle East as well as um, in the UK. He is well versed in the law concerning termination and also has an interest in finance and finance law and is one of the very few barristers that I know who knows his way very well around a spreadsheet, which was very useful in this case. Um, in the time available today, we will be focusing on firstly the right to termination and a practical look at the Energy Works Hull case and Sanjay will be leading that. Then. Simon will look at getting termination right and in particular notices, repudiation, termination triggers and then a quick roundup of the recent case law. Finally we'll have a Q&A at the end um, and you're encouraged and it would be great if you have any questions during the course of the talk today if you could put your questions in the chat and then we can pick those up at the end. And without much further ado Sanjay if I could hand on over to you. Thanks so much for that kind introduction, Karen, and thank you to Fennec Elliott for inviting me. Um, so we're going to talk about Energy Works Hull for the next sort of 25 minutes, and um, uh, you are going to hear, uh, I think, the experience of this case from the people that lived it. Uh, Karen uh, definitely lived it, and to illustrate that I lived it, when I was first instructed on this case, I had one child. Um, uh, Boris Johnson was uh, the Prime Minister, he hadn't yet won an election, Jeremy Corbyn was a leading voice in British politics, Joe Root was the captain of the English cricket team and was about to start the longest winless streak of the English cricket team, um, but hadn't yet uh, got to the end of that, and no one had heard of COVID-19. Um, uh, now everything has changed, there is a different English cricket captain, uh, there is a different Prime Minister, there have been a few since actually, um, and I have two children and my youngest child is nearly three. Uh, so uh, it really, we uh, lived this case, it was a really um, amazing case to be involved in. Um, the judgment's out, 
uh, as you, as many of you will know, it's 230 pages long, so you'll need a sabbatical to read it. Um, and uh, but it is a significant case. It's um, the award of damages were 119 million pounds, which, to the best of my knowledge, is the largest award of damages um, after a TCC trial. There's a lot in there. We aren't going to go through every point because we'd be here all day. Um, but what we're really trying to do is um, give a picture of that trial um, from the point of view of people that were involved in it. Um, so, uh, where to start? A few, uh, a few uh, introductory facts. This was an energy waste, energy from waste plant in Hull, which runs on RDF. And um, RDF is, uh, stands for refuse derived fuel. And it's worth just pausing there on the nature of this plant because um, the, the way that the plant runs is really one of the reasons why this uh, case was so complicated, both from a technical and legal point of view. Um, RDF is effectively lightly processed household waste. Um, and in that regard, this plant is unlike almost any other kind of power plant, because if you think about most other uh, power plants which are in the non-renewable space, um, they have a certain type of fuel, coal, oil, um, uranium, in, in the case of nuclear, new, nuclear stations. Um, whereas the fuel, this sort of plant, is inherently uncertain. It will have uncertain density, uncertain uh, uh, calorific value or energy content, uh, and so what one is trying to achieve from a technical point of view is a, is a plant with stable operation with inherently uncertain fuel. It will have different chemical compositions every time uh, uh, something is loaded into the gasifier. So that's worth having in mind because that, that essential feature of this plant was one of the key uh, 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 points of difference to this case as opposed to others. Um, and, and it poses a very difficult technical challenge, uh, having stable operation uh, with an uncertain fuel. So the key players were uh, Energy Works Hull, the employer, our clients, uh, uh, and M&W was the main contractor. Uh, Outer Tech was the gasification subcontractor, and but you'll hear references to gasification or the gasifier. Um, that is, a, in, in truth, a... Um, uh, fancy word for an incinerator. This is this is a, an incinerator with uh, bells and whistles on. The uh, the fuel is combusted in an oxygen deprived environment, which creates a different sort of gas known as syngas. Uh, th this case was predominantly about delay, and so we've got the key dates on the slide there. Uh, the works uh, effectively commenced on the 20th of November 2015, and M&W was required to achieve takeover by the 9th of April of 2018. Uh, and there was a right of termination if uh, liquidated damages reached a delay damages cap of 15% of the contract price. Missing out all the maths, um, that meant that if uh, there was not takeover by the 7th of January 2019, uh, then there was a right of termination. And there's a, there are important words in the brackets if there are no extensions of time. Uh, and the final bullet point is was really the key battleground in the case. It was Energy Works Hull's responsibility to source RDF for the purposes of commissioning. So the specification and composition of the uh, RDF that was delivered for the purposes of commissioning was EWH's responsibility. And that was really the focus of the battle in the case. We spin the story forward to the beginning of, of 2018, and the works are really in delay. And it, the cause of the delays was pretty much common ground by the time of trial. It was delays to piping, pretty complex pi piping at uh, this plant. Uh, and if you want to know a little bit more about that bit of the case, there was a separate chapter of the lit litigation between uh, M&W and a, a subcontractor called Premier Engineering, uh, and you can read all about that um, in, in that judgment. But the focus of dispute in this uh, litigation was in what happened really in, tw in 2018 
in the beginning of 2019. So uh, by this point, MW is obviously not going to uh, complete the works by the date for takeover. And it decided that its tactic was to start getting aggressive in relation to the fuel. And to, uh, late 2017 and early 2018, uh, there are a series of extremely aggressive emails uh, taking issue with the RDF and the composition of the RDF. There were demands for sight of a quality management system in relation to the RDF. There were uh, a series of extremely long letters about the sampling of RDF uh, and how that would be done. Uh, and uh, there was also a demand that each wagon load of RDF should be pre-certified uh, as showing that the RDF was in specification. And in the absence of all of those assurances, M&W said that it would not process the RDF uh, and would not progress with commissioning. Now that was uh, a very brave stance uh, and uh, they followed through with it. Between the 1st of June 2018, which is broadly speaking, the date on which the plant was certified as being ready to receive RDF, to, for, to the 14th of August 2018, M&W simply suspended its commissioning. It did not receive any RDF during that uh, period. Now the, that raised the key question, was M&W actually entitled to an extension of time uh, for the period where it was suspending commissioning based on its uh, complaints about the RDF. Now, that particular standoff was resolved by a transitional agreement where uh, the parties agreed that uh, they were going to test uh, fuel in a particular way uh, and they were going to um, uh, sample it in a particular way and that led to the, com to the commencement of RDF deliveries. So, crisis somewhat averted until the problem comes back. Uh, November 2018, uh, I, I should explain, when I said in, in, on the 1st of June uh, that the plant was ready to receive RDF, it was only ready in a limited sense in that it was ready uh, to receive RDF in a, in a particular part of the site known as the mechanical pretreatment plant. The gasifier at that point was months away from completion and was not ready to receive RDF. By November 2018, it was ready. And so we had the moment of truth, the moment that uh, uh, RDF or processed RDF, which was confusingly called fuel, um, could be introduced into the gasifier. And at that point, the plant would not stop tripping. Uh, it was simply not possible for there to be sustained uh, combustion of the RDF at that stage. Now, that posed two serious problems, uh, one for M&W and one for EWH. For M&W, the serious problem was that they had seen this script before. There was a sister plant uh, in Scotland called Leavenseat, where there had been very serious problems during commissioning, which frankly could not be resolved. Uh, and so uh, M&W, that raised the spectre, uh, really probably for the first time, that this sort of technology had fundamental problems with it. Uh, for Energy Works Hull, uh, the fuel that had been delivered, the RDF that had been delivered, uh, was not perfectly in specification. And so the question then became, well, does the fact that the RDF uh, is, is not in, uh, in specification perfectly entitle M&W to more time? Uh, m and uh, said yes, EWH said no, m and doubled down and suspended again uh, in January 2019, importantly at the same time as recognising that it also needed to do remedial works on the gasification equipment. Uh, and then uh, Energy Works Hull, <coughs> I would say this, but understandably lost patience, uh, and uh, terminated the contract on the 4th of March of 2019. Now, uh, we're very lucky to have the person in the hot seat uh, on this webinar. 
Uh, prior to my involvement in this case, Karen was the partner with conduct uh, of the case and was heavily involved uh, in the decision to terminate. And this is my opportunity to have my um, parky moment and ask Karen, um, in those months leading up to the termination, uh, leading up to the 4th of March 2019, uh, what was going through your mind and what, what was the, uh, where did you think the balance of risk was? And as I understand it, well, in fact, I know, um, if M&W got an extension of time of 56 days or more, this termination would have been invalid under the contract. So how did you respond to, um, to that challenge? I think what this shows is that um, termination is, in a case like this, where a lot rides on it, termination is not a quick um, method. Um, it's not, not something that you enter into lightly. A lot of thought went into whether or not this contract should be terminated. Um, and actually, I think some of that came out in the judgment because evidence was given on the thought processes and the, the processes leading up to the termination. Um, EWH was in quite a difficult position because they needed to get this plant um, progressed, but they were actually faced with a contractor who was not doing any work. So they, the, the plant couldn't be progressed. And it's, it's safe to say, and this happens on many projects, by that point, um, relationships were very fraught, um, as you can imagine. And particularly the tone of the correspondence had been quite difficult, had been quite challenging. Um, and I have to admit, when M&W um, suspended in the January of um, 2019, I was taken aback by that because I had never seen a contractor actually expressly say we are going to suspend without really much behind it because whilst they were arguing about the fuel or the rdf um it, they, they haven't made out a very detailed case on that and it's a you know we act for contractors all the time and it's it's a very risky situation to try and terminate um a contract without a, and simon will come on to how how you should set up a termination but to terminate a contract without good reason um, and one of the questions that the court was asked in this case was um, well, did M&W have a right to do that because M&W argued that um, if they were in a situation where the employer was in breach of contract then um, they were able to respond in any way they saw fit and the right way in that, cir in that circumstance was to, sus to suspend and the judge, and you'll probably come on to this, but the judge said, no, that's not right. Um, but that was their argument. Um, and that's what we were facing. Um, so very careful thought was given to um, what to do next, what the result of a termination might be, how you might terminate, whether you're terminating under the contract or um, whether you could allege repudiating breach. And in, in the in the event when we did terminate, we alleged both. So we said default under the contract in the alternative repudiatory breach. Um, it, there's almost a checklist, really, I think, on these sorts of projects. When you do start to go down that route to consider termination, you, you, you ask yourself, well, what, what can we do under the contract? What can we do at common law? What will be the practical effect of um, termination? How, how do we go forwards? How are we going to make things better? Will there be, I think it's one of your points, will there be further delay um, if we terminate? Will there be further delay if we don't terminate? We ha you have to weigh those two things up. Um, the, the point about delay um, was very much on our minds. And um, I think anybody in that sort of situation would not go forward without having some idea of what their position was. And we, um, we did a, a sort, of, sort, of, sort of provisional analysis or thought around what an extension of time might be or what uh, entitlement m and might have. And I think that is sensible in the circumstances. So you take all those different things together and you weigh them up. Um, and we talked, um, we, we had our KC um, on board as well, and we talked to him and we talked um, to the board and we it all together and decided that that was the best way forward so as i said termination is not it's not something you just decide to do it's it's a long process and you well it can be a long process but it's a it's a proper process and you you have to take into account all these different factors and then having taken those into account decide to press the button yeah 
Yeah. Well, thank you, Karen. That is such valuable insight um, from from the person on the tools, so to speak, um, when it, when it came to t termination. Um, what, sorry, one other thing. Sorry, I had a few notes, but one one thing I just would add: there was a there was a tell for us with M and W, and that was that with the extension of time, they had not, through the course of the project, made any applications for an extension of time until about three or four months before the original contract completion date. So you'd had two and a half, nearly three years of no claims for an extension of time. And that, for an experienced construction lawyer, you think, well, that's odd. And therefore, they may be trying to set up a situation themselves. Yeah, yeah. Let's, let's turn to what um, the judge said at trial. Um, so as we've sort of just teed up, the key, the key issue was whether or not M&W was going to get an extension of time based on its fuel-based complaints. Um, and uh, it, as I say, and, and, and um, this was a spectre in a sense uh, over, my, over my involvement in the case. 56 days um, actually isn't a lot of time uh, uh, in, in lots of contexts. And really, we had to knock these arguments out in full uh, in order to um, to defend the contractual uh, termination, um, and um, and we did. Uh, Mr. Justice Pepperell decided that M and W did not have a right to suspend commissioning activities or refuse to uh, proceed with commissioning activities simply because the RDF was out of specification. And there were really three uh, planks. Um, to the analysis. The first um, is based on that really well-known uh, term in construction contracts, which is that the contractor's got to proceed regularly and diligently. And if they're suspending, then they probably aren't doing that. And uh, you need an express contractual right of suspension in order to suspend. And this contract really only provided for a right of suspension in the event of non-payment, and that hadn't happened. Um, there was no right to suspend or no express right to suspend simply because um, RDF for, the, for commissioning purposes was out of specification. Another point that the judge uh, 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 drew on was that uh, M&W was expressly required to proceed with its works regardless of the existence of a dispute. In those circumstances, uh, suspension of works is unlikely to be the right response to an alleged breach of contract. Then finally, and this is more fuel specific, um, what M&W's argument ignored was that while, while there was an RDF specification, and there were various ways in which one could uh, not comply with it, there was a specific category of what was called unacceptable RDF, which is really oversized RDF, um, uh, traces of things that might be flammable or explosive or something like that, something that would cause uh, a health and safety problem, frankly, uh, at, at the plant. That was the only category of RDF that M&W was entitled to reject. It wasn't simply entitled to reject um, all kinds of RDF um, simply because they are out of specification. So that's the contract analysis. And frankly, um, there may not be too many transferable lessons uh, from that analysis because that was um, a, a conclude. Those were conclusions based on the wording of this contract. But the real point of general interest is that, um, and this may surprise lots of people on the webinar, there are not a host of authorities saying that at common law a contractor cannot just simply sus suspend as a response to a breach of contracts. This now is probably the leading authority on the bit on whether or not a contractor can suspend a common law as a response to a breach of contract. And unsurprisingly, the answer to that is no, you can't at common law simply suspend performance because the other party is in breach. Uh, and I've got the paragraph uh, references to the judgment on that point. Um, if there are still any uh, commercial managers or, or, or contract managers, uh, for contractors tempted to suspend as a means of uh, uh, exerting commercial leverage over their employer, here are a few further reasons why that is a really bad idea. Uh, the first is that um, the suspension was uh, treated as a repudiation of the contract at, at common law, 
that is uh, paragraph 302, and it was also treated as a willful default. So uh, if, if ever uh, you needed a further lesson uh, for why suspending is not a valid uh, response to a, a perceived breach of contract, please print out the relevant paragraphs of this judgment, have them on your desk, and let them be a salutary lesson not to be tempted to do it. Other points of interest on liability, um, I th I'm going to rattle through these just because of time. Um, the analysis of uh, M&W's programmes is really interesting. Um, and what uh, the judge concluded was that it was a really serious matter that M&W was not being candid in its update programmes, showing the nature of, of the defects and how long it would take to fix them. And frankly, the disclosure showed that they were, um, hmm, well, there's a word that I'm thinking about that I can't use, but, uh, <laughs> but being much less than candid about uh, how, how long it would take uh, to uh, rectify those defects. And I think there is now a, um, a body of law emerging that uh, where, you, where a contractor puts in programmes which are less than candid about the situation on the ground, that can be um, a failure to proceed regularly and diligently. That was the conclusion of Mr Justice Ramsey and Vivergo and Red Hall Fuels. Uh, and it could uh, give rise to a right of uh, termination. Um, so, uh, it's, and it certainly, in, in this case, amounted to a willful default. And I think if the judge had been required to decide it, they might well have found that that was, uh, that he might well have found that that was um, a repudiation. Um, another point, which I think is live after this judgment, is about how much delay amounts to a repudiation of common law. And I think there are now two strands of authority. Uh, there is um, Energy Works Hull, which draws on uh, a number of the shipbuilding cases from the 90s and early noughties, uh, saying, well, if the parties have agreed a delay damages cap, the parties have agreed for themselves when the scale of delay goes to the root of the contracts. And therefore, you are entitled to terminate both under the contracts and at common law if the delay has exceeded that cap. Uh, contrast that approach to the approach of Mr Justice Ramsey in Virgo and Red Hall Fuels again, where uh, he uh, concluded that uh, the scale of de delay in that case was not sufficient to evince a, um, an intention no longer to be bound by the contracts. And it does seem to me that the analysis on this point differs depending on which formulation of the repudiation test you are using. If you are deciding whether or not the scale of delay has gone to the root of the contract, you may well come to a different conclusion to if you decide that the test for repudiation is a failure to evince a contract, is, is, is an intention uh, not to proceed with the contract. So um, I think two different strands of authority there. Uh, and uh, I would say that the analysis in Energy Works Hull favours a stricter position, which is that if you uh, if if there is delay in excess of the cap, then potentially there is a contractual right to terminate. Um, it will depend always on the terms of the contract. But that's an interesting point, I think. Uh, final slide from me. This is about termination losses. This, I think, is one of the most interesting issues in the case. Um, I think unconventionally, um, this uh, Energy Works Hull brought a claim for its post-termination financing losses. And uh, what that was, was its debt burden, additional debt burden, as a result of uh, operations at the plant being delayed. Uh, and uh, uh, that included a, the post-termination period. And so the 53.1 million pounds was the additional debt interest uh, incurred between the date of termination and the actual start of operations at the plant. Now, I have not been involved in proceedings before where a claim for general damages uh, of that nature has been brought as part of your termination claim, but it was in principle allowed in full. Now, 
Um, I say in principle because if you read the judgment carefully, uh, you will see that the judge left open a question as to whether or not uh, M and W's defects were the true cause of all of the delay to the start of operations post termination, and there were particular findings of fact based on defects which suggested that potentially the post termination uh, uh, period was um, uh, taken up rectifying defects that were not in fact m and w's responsibility now if you are considering uh bringing a claim of this nature uh, you may well be thinking well hold on a minute how do i do a delay analysis uh, to show that all of the delay to operations post termination is due to the defective works of the original contractor now if that is something that you are thinking I can only suggest certain thoughts <laughs> because this point is not actually was not actually decided by the judge um, prior to the parties settling. And I've put my uh, a real summary of my thoughts in the final bullet points, which is that um, there are cases out there, lodge holes colliery being one, and Hall van der Heiden is is actually a really good summary. Uh, of uh, the cases in this field, which uh, include the Great Ormond Street case, uh, which I know many on this call will be familiar with, suggesting that your actual losses post-termination are the starting point for any analysis of your post-termination losses. And uh, one might say, well, that's obviously a preferable position to uh, the employer being needing to carry out a detailed critical path analysis of the replacement contractors program, which in fact has nothing to do with how the original contractor was intending to sequence their own works. Um, so that's just a thought, um, but um, I think that these claims for general damages uh, following termination could well be um, the direction that um, termination cases in this sort of infrastructure project go in. Um, and it's something that we'll all have to get much more familiar with. So with that, I'm going to hand over to Simon, uh, who's going to um, put all of this um, uh, case study in some sort of legal context. Thank you, Sanjay. Just, just, very, just very briefly on that last, last point in your slide, as a matter of interest, I think with these very large technology cases, where you've got only a few numbers, number of players really who are able to deliver the type of technology and work and materials that are specialistly that are specialist and required for, for this type of kind of fluidized bed burner with all of the technology, et cetera. The courts have seem to be tending to show, certainly from the TCC, as you say, that the actual cost basis of damages basis, where you can't really go out and go for competitive tender, is the, is the right way of going. So I won't say any more about that, but I think it's a very good point, as you say, and one that's kind of ripe for watching this space. Right, uh, I'm going to be talking about um, getting the, t the termination right in terms of notices, and Karen has quite rightly set the, 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 the kind of tone of, of the reality, which is that um, utmost care is required by all those involved in the process, not just the client, but obviously the lawyers in relation to drafting the notices, etc. Um, insofar as obviously lawyers get involved with that, which is relatively often. So I'm going to be looking at um, these points, the first one there, the possibility that an invalid notice could be a repudiation, which uh, will come out from a number of the cases, um, but contrasting the kind of strict approach that um, one sees in Hudson and Keating with that in a, actually a conveyancing case uh, of eminence property in Heaney, where um, a slightly more enlightened view was taken in relation to uh, an invalid uh, notice to um, to complete in that case, but as I say, I'll come to that. Um, even if Hudson is right, um, what actually is an invalid notice? What, what actually does that amount to? And does any technical defect make the notice invalid? Um, I've said there, we don't think so, and certainly not in every case. And I remark there really the contrast between um, the uh, famous decision in Manai where the judge in that case made that uh, distinction that you might remember from law school about uh, blue paper and pink paper position, where uh, he basically said, you know, if the contract calls for a specific bit of paper in a particular colour, then you don't uh, you don't comply with the notice requirements by getting getting that wrong. 
And then interestingly, a more recent case, which I'll come to of energy holdings, where the view was taken that, that, that the strictures not necessarily being something that um, would amount to a repudiation in, in relation to getting the notice wrong. So a repudiatory breach might, might not be affected by getting the notice wrong. So again, I'll have a look at that. So um, the kind of context of putting that into perhaps the reality of, of conventional contracts is the one I mentioned there, which is that it seems unlikely that sending a termination notice on time, but by email when the contract requires fax amounts to repudiation. Well, I'm not answering that question because a lot of cases have decided and we'll look at one or two of them that that actually serving uh, incorrectly in that form um, is is a non-compliant notice. But the question is whether that's actually repudiatory. And then we look at um, the the ability to rely on contractual and common law termination in the same notice. And we've seen obviously in the EWH case, as Karen mentioned, uh, that the that, that obviously the notice served in, in in relation to both common law and contractual termination. And then uh, the important uh, distinction, which is sometimes overlooked by um, lawyers, um, is the ability to rely on common law termination, even if it's not mentioned in the termination notice. And that's the famous case of Boston Deep Sea Fishing, um, which was um, given the sort of fresh breath, let's say, in a case called Le Leo Felis and Lonsdale, um, in a case about seven or eight years ago. So I'll be looking at those. and. Um, in the context of the last slide there, uh, the last point in the point, um, perhaps no right to claim damages on the basis uh, that, um, base, on the basis other than one that was initially relied on, is really just making the point that whilst the common law position seems to be that one can rely on, on another reason uh, in a repudiatory breach situation that wasn't referred to in a contractual termination notice, there might be a restriction on the ability to claim damages for that. So those kind of subtleties are we'll, we'll be having a look at. Um, right, let's make sure I don't overshoot the slides here. Um, so termination under the contract, a word or two on that. Um, as I say, a statement of the obvious, obvious in, as, in as much as exercising contractual rights under a commercial uh, contract is often not straightforward. Um, and certainly the, the best advice that we give clients who are contemplating termination is, first of all, is that really something you want to do? Are there any other commercial options? Can you negotiate a way out of a contract or perhaps omit a key section of works or do something which isn't as radical as actually terminating? Um, and obviously those kind of option analyses are done by clients regularly. Um, but the important thing, of course, in terms of uh, contractual notice provisions is actually making sure uh, primarily that the, the requirements of the contract are adhered to strictly. So I say there, the law requires that any valid termination notice must comply strictly with the termination requirements. Um, and the analogy uh, that I touched on a second ago from that Manai investment and Eagle Star case, it was good old Lord Hoffman that said if, if the clause in the contract had said that the termination clause had to be on blue paper, it would be no good having it served on, on pink, pink paper. So the po important point there is identifying and satisfying the termination conditions is, is complex and often more complex than just a question of whether you've got the right bit of paper, because obviously there's a question of who provides the notice, where the notice is served, and whether it's whether appropriate timescales are strictly adhered to. Uh, secondly, even where the termination notice is correctly drafted and validly served, a right of termination can be inadvertently lost where a party acts in a manner inconsistent with the termination notice. And we've certainly come, 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 come across a number of instances where this has happened over the years. And, and that's kind of where a situation arises where the um, party seeking to terminate um, does something inconsistent, like, for example, um, making a demand for payment of certain outstanding sums that were due under the contract, and then finding that it waives its right to terminate because the other party then actually pays the amount or most of the majority of the amount that's claimed and there's an argument about whether termination actually was achieved. So the point really is stakes are very high um, when it comes to correctly terminating and um, doing so incorrectly can often result in the seesaw swinging the other way and uh, the conduct of the terminating party becoming repudiatory and whilst in some instances we can save the day on that, um, Often that causes a major problem and 
uh, is the last thing that the terminating party wanted to to arise. Just uh, in terms of um, a little word or two about repudiatory breach and uh, termination at common law. Um, conduct is repudiatory um, if it deprives the innocent party of substantially the whole of the benefit intended to be received from performance of the contract. So always think about repudiatory breach in really those terms. And it, it, it came from the 1962 case of Hong Kong for shipping and Kawasaki um, and is still is still good law. So depriving the innocent party substantially of the whole benefit is, you know, in relation to what Sanjay was just talking about in terms of the suspension activities of MW, one obviously is looking at the microscope in that kind of a context. And the other, other way of looking at repudiatory breach um, that any of you who are lawyers on this webinar will remember is obviously the good old common law principle of the breach going to, to the root of the contract, a slightly archaic sort of um, way, form of words really to describe a situation. But at the end of the day, going to the root means, you know, so fundamental as to kind of un undermine the party's intentions as to the performance of the contract. So always think about whether a breach is serious enough in terms of relying on something for a repudiatory breach. It's got to basically be very, very serious. Uh, it's got to be it's certainly got to be material and substantially material. So breach of a condition or breach of an innominate term um, th that is something that, again, goes substantially to the benefit of the contract of the whole contract are the sort of things that you're actually looking for. And again, you know, some of the cases that um, you'll see in the Hudson chapter and Keating chapters on termination uh, expose those instances where parties have not had um, good cause to demonstrate um, that it actually was something going to the root of the contract or um, of substantial be going to the benefit of the contract. So I've, I've put good old Arnold Schwarzenegger on that slide just to emphasize that termination trigger uh, should be carefully used really um, and query whether you want to use it at all. Uh, and of course, circumstances like uh, Sanjay and, and Karen were talking about with MW in relation to hitting the cap, et cetera, on liquidated damages are certainly a point at which that becomes often a major consideration. So, um, as I say, what, the way in which perhaps it's important to think about how the court or tribunal will look at termination is that, um, and how they construe termination clauses and, and uh, the facts around them, is that the courts basically take the starting view that the they look at the consequences of what the termination uh, will actually result in. And of course, that is, you know, it's a draconian remedy. There's no way to, to describe it other than that. And it brings the contract to an, to an end with dramatic consequences in terms of perf future performance. And obviously a lot of construction contracts suspend the obligation to pay if it's a contractual termination, et cetera. So over the years, the courts have evolved um, principles um, of construction so that one really doesn't terminate by accident. So, you know, when I say to trainees, uh, you know, why the reasons why these uh, particular rules have developed in standard form contracts in terms of uh, a first initial notice and a final notice and a cure period is to basically make sure that things are, are not done inadvertently and there's a proper due process and machinery under the contract that's followed. Uh, and a party who purports to operate the contractual uh, determination clause um, when it's not entitled to or, or basically factually or on legal grounds runs in, into problems. Uh, and one example of that from a construction case of about 30 years ago, Architectural Installations and James Gibbons, um, in that case where he was making the point that there must be a sensible connection between the two notices, the initial notice and the termination notice. And, uh, you know, with JCT, obviously there's a finite period uh, in which the two notices are kind of nextally connected. But in this particular contract, there was 11 months uh, hiatus between the first notice and then the final termination. And there are other cases which reveal circumstances where the, 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 the final notice doesn't actually quite say that it's a termination. And so it doesn't actually kind of properly link itself with the initial notice and the continuance of the breach. So a case just to be aware of. And then I've said there, clear words are needed to remove um, a, a party's common law right to accept repudiation. 
but watch out if you invoke the common law right in, ineffectually. So, you know, the common law, common law darling is always there. The JCT forms, as we know, expressly preserve common law rights. And anyone who's sensibly drafting a termination notice will always uh, include words to the effect as an alternative case that the basis of the facts that are described in the notice also suffice for the purposes of, of common law repudiation. So here, the case about the importance of considering termination rights carefully is a recent case, only last year, James Kemble and K-Line. Uh, it's a commercial case to do with transportation and uh, uh, haulage and containerized transport, which isn't a construction case. But um, basically what happened there was uh, James Kerbel uh, purported to invoke a contractual termination provision relying on the other party's w alleged willful or persistent breach of a service agreement relating to, as I say, this containerized shipping um, uh, products and, and commitments. Uh, the court found on a true construction that the contractual termination mechanism could only be invoked if there was actual, as opposed to prospective or anticipatory, uh, breach at the time the notice was sent. And the fact that the common law termination rights may be invoked for an anticipatory breach wasn't relevant in this case in circumstances where the terminating party had relied solely on a contractual mechanism based on actual breach and had not sought to terminate at common law. So that's important. They hadn't sought to terminate common law. And really, the point that comes out of that case is clear words are needed to remove a party's common law right to accept um, repudiation. And the judge doubted. Um, oh, I don't know what happened then. I didn't touch that. Um, Apologies, Simon, that was me. Don't worry, just trying to get it to move. This next one after that. Yes, so, um, yes, yeah, so I, I really that's probably all I wanted to say about the importance of considering termination rights carefully that James Kemble um, revealed there. And then looking at a case, a construction case this time from 28 years ago in Lockhart, Lockland and um, Rickwood in 1995 um, on, on termination of a repudiatory breach and the consequences of getting it wrong. This is a slightly unusual building contract in the sense that it was a contract to build a, a, a property, a house. And the clause, a clause in the contract, the building contract, provided a mechanism whereby the owner if he was dissatisfied with um, the performance in terms of the speed with which the property was being constructed, um, it, it could basically um, apply to the president of the South End on Sea District Law Society. That photo that you can see on the slide there is actually the pier at South End. I was just trying to get something that had some connection as a as a kind of reminder. But the president of the South End Law Society, South End on Sea Law Society, to appoint an architect or surveyor. Who would then, subject to issuing a certificate, determine um, whether the um, the case or the argument in relation to slow progress progress had been made out or not, and, and it provided the basis to get out of the out of the contract. The provision provided not merely for, determ for determination of the contract's employment, but also for termination of the agreement as a whole. So it completely uh, nullified it if if it was made out. Um, the employer was uh, dissatisfied with the rate of progress of the building of, of the property that. Was intended for him and he he oh that's moved again without me touching it um sorry don't know what's happened there um that slide simon yeah it is well, that one isn't it yeah yeah so so what happened there was that um he failed the 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 the, the, the party seeking to bring about a termination failed to invoke that clause too but instead relied on their common law rights and the court of appeal ha held went to the court of appeal that an express uh, determination clause even of the type and the common law right to repudiate could exist side by side but the common law right only arises in circumstances where the contractor displays a clear intention not to be bound by the contract a mere delay in this case by the builder in actually um, constructing the property was not did not amount to grounds for repudiation and there's a few of the, the decisions in relation to delay of itself which is of course why uh, proceeding regularly and diligently is a relatively difficult ground to make out 
without um, special facts. So let's try and move on to the next one. Yes, yeah, so um, now I want to say a word or two about uh, the eminence property and Heaney case, another property case. Um, and this is one really where I've said there was a generous view that was taken uh, of the terminator. Uh, in this case, it was a court of appeal case. Um, and it was all about whether either party was in repudiatory breach and the importance of really diving into and the court actually scrutinizing the particular facts sitting around the the basis on which the um, step to terminate uh, had taken place. In this case, Eminence was a vendor and I said there Heaney was the purchaser. It was a contract under the Law Society standard conditions of sale, fourth edition. The vendor of the property served a contractual notice. This is a notice to complete. Um, basically 10 days to complete was the requirement in the notice to complete. But by a miscalculation, uh, the solicitor that drafted the notice um, purported to say that, that the, the termination of the contract and the forfeiture of the deposit would take place over after only eight days. So got was out by two days, a bit, a bit of an error. Um, the purchaser argued that this was of itself repudiatory, and you could pr perhaps understand that because he was saying, I'm getting a notice to complete and it's premature in terms of what it's saying the, the, the outcome of that would be. And um, the Court of Appeal actually, surprisingly, when it went up to the Court of Appeal, um, disagreed that it was repudiatory conduct um, and really came to the view that the 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 vendor um, the vendor being eminence had acted in good faith but obviously had made a kind of innocent error and in, in construction contracts innocent errors are, are not necessarily regularly found by judges but it's interesting that that was the view that was was formulated here and it's quite similar to I think Woodar and Wimpy which is one of the construction cases of about 20 years ago in a similar light. But what the claimant had done was obviously mistaken, but, but in that sense was viewed as something which a reasonable person could make. And, as, and for that reason, uh, it was held that it, it didn't demonstrate an unequivocal attention to, intention to abandon the contract, which was obviously required if you're going to try and make out a uh, repudiatory breach. So the question of whether either party was in repudiatory breach, the point that the judge made or the Court of Appeal made clear was that um, it can't be reached on an in principle basis, but one has to look at all of the evidence. And really that's the importance that uh, I impress upon in that, in that context. There are then three major cases, and I can see we've got only six minutes uh, to go, uh, that I want to touch on in relation to um, termination. And we're quite lucky to get three cases from the TCC in pretty quick succession, um, because you know what, what they tend to demonstrate is a kind of fresh review of the law in this area in this area so let me just um quickly perhaps deal with key points coming out of the notices um the first one uh first point really i wanted to make in the context of these cases is uh the importance of considering each part of the jct process i'm, I'm wanting to concentrate on jct because we could spend a couple of days on this and deal with all the standard forms um so the, the, the important clause that most of you will be familiar with in termination in JCT is Clause 8, and Clause 8.41 of both the standard contract, uh, standard building contract and the DB form sets out that the, the employer's right to terminate for certain specified events. Uh, we're all familiar with the various grounds. Um, under 8.41 of the standard building contract, it's the architect or contract administrator um, who may serve the initial notice on the contract to setting out the, the, the specific default that's relied upon. And on clause 8, stop 4, stop 2, the contract has then got this cure period essentially of 14 days after the initial notice to um, cease to um, continue the specified default. But if it fails to do so, in the opinion of the employer, then the employer may, on uh, 21 days, within 21 days notice from the initial notice, on the expiry of that 14 day period, serve a further notice. So that's all kind of re relatively straightforward, might, one might think. Um, where and, and who should the notices be served on? Well, one stop seven of JCT sets out those requirements and says that the notices should be in writing. I think that's pretty obvious. Um, and unless otherwise agreed between the parties, served by, be served by hand or prepaid post to the recipient's address in the contract particulars. Now, again, time and again, clients come to us and they've served the, the notice on the wrong party or they've been the recipient of the notice of a notice and it's not been served 
correctly. Um, so always look out for that. Um, remember, it's it's important that that it's at served at the right address or the principal or registered office if if that's the default position. Clause one point seven four states that when sent by POTUS by post, sorry, a notice must be by recorded signed for special delivery. So again, another important requirement. And the cases are clear that nothing less or different than strict compliance with these requirements would suffice for an effectual contractual termination under the JCT. So what about any non-trivial departure? Well, non-trivial departures from the service provisions will invalidate notices. And the Thomas Barnes case to do with um, the construction of a, a very large, I wouldn't say bus shelter, more like bus depot, which had got quite a lot of uh, attraction, a lot of tension in the construction press at the time it was being built. Um, in that case, the notice was uh, deemed insufficient for service as the contractor had not expressly notified the employer that notices could be served on its normal business address. And it was determined that the employer had failed to terminate in accordance with the contractual provisions. We'll see later on that the repudiatory breach was made out, but they failed in relation to the contractual notices. So if you hadn't, you hadn't got a basis for a repudiatory breach, that would be obviously a pretty bad result. On the clause, uh, the question next is who should serve the notice? On the JCT, onto the standard building contract, the notice, the first notice should come from the architect or contract administrator. In the design and build form, that should be the employer. There are some academic and legal arguments about whether the employer's agent under the DMB form can serve the notice, but my view is that the employer's agent cannot, even though there are provisions for saying that the EA can do various things under the contract for the employer. In the TCC case of Struthers and Davies, the court considered the validity of the notice in terms of who served it and found that the termination, note, the termination clause should be strictly construed and that the language surrounding who served the notice was not cast in mandatory terms, but that there were sound reasons for requiring the initial notice to come from the contract administrator rather than from the client. And so the initial notice had instead come from the employer directly but both it and the subsequent attempt to terminate or reliance on it were held to be invalid. So again, a bit of a, a bit of a, a concern there. And in terms of when the notice should be served, um, obviously serving prematurely is not a good idea. Uh, and the cases are pretty clear in relation to uh, what the situation there is under JCT. One stop, seven stop, four um, JCT forms says that um, it's, if it's served by post, it's deemed to be served on the second business day after posting. Again, a common mistake is the assumption it's served the next day. And in the in the Thomas Barnes case, um, that the employer sent the notice of termination by email and by post, but removed the contractor from site on the same day as the notices are sent. And again, there's this common assumption that you know you can hand the notice to someone on site and then start locking the gates and um, barring the contractor. No, no, you can't get into, in, into difficulty. Um, I'm conscious that we're at uh, one o'clock. So I think what I all I can say, and this is not to try and shortchange um, this, this audience, but just to say that I have um, dealt with the Boston deep sea um, fishing case in terms of lying on grounds other than those uh, that relied on at the time of termination being permissible. I've also identified what's called the Hessler exception, which sounds a bit like a headlock type move in wrestling, but is actually um, a basis on which uh, a party that's um, attempted to be um, terminated can essentially run an argument if the breach could have been um, put right to actually block that and some law in relation and around that. Um, so that is a bit of a whistle stop tour. That wonderful structure is the, the bus shelter in the case that I was just referring to, uh, which I said was a fine design, but isn't really the purpose of this talk. Um, so perhaps if I if I end there. Simon, thank you. Um, I'm conscious of time, but um, we did say we do a Q&A at the end. So if we perhaps rattle through one or two questions very quickly. We've only actually had one question in the chat. So I'll, I'll, I'll um, start with that and then maybe throw another one in if we've got time. Um, so our question is, what provisions of the JCT contract would you say can survive termination?
Sorry, so what? Sorry, say that again. Sorry, I missed that. Um, what provisions of the JCT contract would you say can survive termination? Oh, that's a pretty difficult question. Um, <laughs> what conditions can survive termination? What provision? What, what provisions? Uh, I mean, uh, to some extent, it's it, resolution clause. Sorry, probably sorry. Does. I mean, the, the, the dispute resolution clause probably does. Um, I would have. Oh yeah, I mean, this is the subtle difference between terminate determination of the employment of the contract or termination. The contract, the, the contract survives for the purposes of, for certain purposes, obviously, and expressly has as machinery for dealing with payment and so forth in in circumstances where the project is then completed by the employer or artists and tradesmen or whatever by the employer. Um, Absolutely it, right, and, and as you say, Simon, it, it is the fact that what is referred to under the JCT is the termination of the employment of the contractor, rather than the actual termination of the contract. The contract's still alive. Yeah, the, co the contract re certainly remains alive in re relation to JCT, and um, al also in terms of a putative breach, any extant obligations um, up to the point of, of the termination are still matters which are justiciable and arguable about in relation to the to the to the contract between the two parties um obviously the contract after that point depending on who wins the repudiation argument um you you get into the scenario that you've got to got with um energy works hull um sanjay anything to add but just that the only thing that i would say is that um and the problem is uh this is one of those uh, difficult questions that uh, I might I might have to spend some time thinking about. But um, if there are particular provisions of the contract which are um, unfavourable, you might have a different result depending on whether or not uh, you're seeking contractual termination of the employment or repudiation. Um, and it may well be that more provisions of the contract fall away in a repudiation scenario than in a contractual termination um, but for all the reasons that we've been discussing during this webinar um, you're going to need some pretty extraordinary facts to make out a case on repudiation um, so um, I'm afraid that's going to be one of those questions where we have to plump with the horrible answer it depends I mean certain contracts give the contractor sorry, the employer who's terminating, for example, various rights to call for things to be produced by the contractor, and they are finite in terms of time limits being set. I mean, things like if you're terminating contractually, confidentiality provisions mm. in the contracts, and certainly in larger projects, those are quite extensive provisions. It, it's a good thing to think about that quite carefully, because in a repeatedly breach, breach scenario, you may find that there becomes an argument about uh, the other party being able to actually say something about um, the, the context of its repudiation being caused by the other party. So, but there, there, will, there will be provisions that, that do survive. Yeah, I, I think a final observation is that that is a, a point you need to take into account when you're thinking about repudiating or um, using contractual, the contractual mechanism for default, because certainly in the Hull case, the, that form of contract was based on the ICME. And if you terminated the default, there was a very detailed set of provisions as to what happened next with the, with the handing over of documents and the, the ability to go onto site and what happened with materials and equipment, which you don't have if you repudiate. You, you just and don't the assignment have that. In your no. case, yeah, the assignment issue with the subcontractor, yeah. So, um, so just, just looking at the time, I think that's probably where we should leave it. Um, but thank you so much, Simon and Sanjay, for, for your um, discussion today. Hopefully thank you, you as well. Lots no, back and, into one hour. <laughs> <laughs> Do you know, that's exactly what I was going to say. Uh, firstly, thank you, Karen, Simon, San Sanjay. Um, a huge amount to pack into an hour. Uh, thank you to the audience for hanging on with us. Um, again, rest assured that the slides and an on-demand on -demand recording of this will be available on our website. And I put in the chat the link to where you'll find that in due course. But again, um, thank you so much. Um, I think, and Karen Sanjay has been brilliant to hear straight from you know, the horse's mouth, as it were. You lived and breathed it, the whole case. And Sanjay, you delivered children during it. So fantastic to hear um, that as well. But 
all that we have left now, and thank you everyone um, for joining us today and for hanging on. Um, just if you can join us in a month's time, our next webinar, there we go. Our next webinar is at the end of March, and you'll see that Simon's going to return and uh, 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 again, and he's going to be joined by Ben Smith, one of our senior associates, and Omar El Jadi from Atkin Chambers, and they're going to be discussing the safety, the Building Safety Act. Where are we at? Um, discussing the latest developments there, recent case law, and what's on the horizon uh, in respect of the Building Safety Act. So with that, uh, thank you again, everyone, for joining us today. We hope you are safe and well where you might be around the world, and we hope to see you at one of our upcoming webinars soon. Thank you again, everyone. Have a good day.